shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters Podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with my good friend Tom. Howdy! How are you doing this wonderful evening? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. It's been a uh, crazy couple weeks for me, a lot going on. Of course, obviously, uh, everyone by now, if you've <laughs> if you either heard our Picard episode or you skipped it because you didn't see Picard yet... <laughs> But uh, that took up a, a good amount of time uh, for me. <laughs> yes, it did. You also had a bit of joy just trying to finish watching the series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was having a little bit of trouble with my the, my, the source of my show was uh, giving me some uh, some issues. But uh, I finally was able to do it. You powered through it. You got it. And yeah, we got to finish it in all of its wonderful gloriousness. Yes. But you know, go back and, and listen to that to hear what we thought about that. I've been watching some pretty cheesy um, kind of sci-fi horror films yes, you have. this past week. I went back and watched one. I don't even know why I decided to watch it. It's just one of those weird ones that probably came up in Amazon Prime, you know, kind of you might like, which doesn't say much for a lot of other things that I've been watching. Uh, Track of the Moon Beast from 1976. That's a That's a bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> From what I read, they filmed a, a much more graphic film, like a like hard R, rated R, lots of gore film. And then it sat on the shelf for years because it couldn't find a distributor. Okay. And then someone took it and edited it down so they could air it on TV. And so the only print that exists anymore is this TV release. Either they got really, really rambunctious with the scissors, or this film probably never made any damn sense. (laughs) Both are possible. Both possible, not sure. Pretty bad film. Uh, They did it on the latter years of uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. I think I'm going to have to go back and watch that episode. I don't really recall it. I th- I'm sure it was in the sci-fi years. What did I say earlier? 99? Yeah, 98, 99, something like that. Yeah, so I'll have to go back and watch the uh, the riff version of that one. Yeah, it's got me curious because, uh, like, I, like I said, outside of the show, uh, Pluto's uh, Mystery Science Theater channel runs everything nonstop, and I have not seen that in rotation. So now i got to go dig it up. Another one I watched was 2012 was a British film called Storage 24. It, st- it stars uh, Noel Clark, who played uh, Mickey in the uh, first season of the rebooted Doctor Who. Okay, yeah. And this entire thing, the whole thing is about uh, a, a bunch of people that are trapped in a 24-hour uh, storage facility mm-hmm. who, uh, because of an accident outside, it its system's gone haywire and it's in lockdown. They can't get the gate open and they're trapped inside this storage facility with some sort of alien nasty that's trying to eat them. As you do. Yeah. And it's a doctor who episode with uh, more gore and less sonic screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> well, that can be fun too. <laughs> it It wasn't, Terrible. It was better than Track of the Moon Beast. Well, yeah, but we've not exactly set a high bar there. <laughs> no, no. And it was definitely better than the other film I watched from 2009. This one coming from Australia called The Dark Lurking. Okay. Just from IMDb, eight remaining survivors of a secret research facility barricade themselves away from a horde of ancient and deadly creatures. Uh, yeah, there's... Uh, weird mutated creatures that are trying to eat people. There's talk of like uh, Lucifer, like it's some sort of mystical, biblical prophecy sort of thing. And of course it's, you know, some evil corporation that's behind it all. The corporation is initials is I D A G F. 
I don't give a yeah yeah f yeah yeah, and I'm thinking, well, if you don't, then why should I? <laughs> and, and why should you? It is absolutely pointless. It's <laughs> it's just mind numbing. It's it's really bad. The uh, the ADR is just off. It's not that. It just sounds wrong. Mm-hmm. There's just something about it that even though these are the people, it's probably the people's real voices, they sound like they're being dubbed. Oh, wow. And that's really frustrating. I hate that. Yeah, no, that's annoying. Yeah, when when sound is out of sync, even just by a hair, it just throws everything off. It's, it's not that it's out of sync. It's just obviously not recorded in the same situation, or it's not been tweaked to sound like it's taking place when they're supposedly then their saying voice the is line. out of body. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, out of body. Thank you. That's a very good description. Yeah. Yeah, that's equally annoying. <laughs> I find that more annoying than out of sync. <laughs> I, I could get that because at least you can place the voice with the character at the time if it's out of sync. You just mm-hmm. know that the lips aren't matching up. But but yeah, if it's coming otherworldly, <laughs> even though you know it's the voice of that character, it's just off-putting all the way around. Yeah, yeah the the monster creature and gore effects were impressive. Yeah. Um, but that's all I've really got to say for it. Yeah, I commented somewhere else that I've been watching, and someone pointed out that the the easiest shot to film is close-ups because you don't need to worry about what's going on around everybody Mm -hmm. and it's really easy to light and they're like this film must have been really easy to shoot (laughs) (laughs) because there is a whole lot of close-ups it's just close-up to close-up to (laughs) close-up there's very few scenes where there's more than one person in the shot oh nice i love those uh (laughs) yeah (laughs) there's a few films where i've watched that i'm convinced that uh the actors were never in the actual same space at the same time. <laughs> yes, I think I've seen the same sort of films. Now, I, I'm going to take this moment because you, you like you, you're going over these these ones that you've watched, and you clearly they're bad. Um, I'm going to oppose to you. Have you ever started a film that you did not finish? Uh. <laughs> Not that I can recall. I may not have finished it that night. Right, no. I I may have decided I'm not really even watching this. I'm going to stop it and go to bed or something like that. But I'll probably come back and finish it. It might be a day or two later. It's going to be a day where it's like, ah, I just, I don't have anything else. Let me, let me finish this. I got an hour left. I got a half an hour left. I'll finish this film. And, and, and I think that's why you and I do this show is we are that committed to somebody's attempt to tell a story through film making or TV making, but we'll stick with it because we we want to acknowledge that somebody's put in the creative effort, no matter how bad that might have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, if it's a film that I'm actually intending on reviewing or discussing, I will pay attention to it. Sure, absolutely. Now. Now, like, um, oh, what was the last one I just mentioned? Oh, The Dark Lurking. Yeah. I'll admit, I spent a good deal of that movie on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> just absorbing it in the moments to which you could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yes, and we all, we there's what we discuss on the show, and then there's just what we take in for our own amusement. Um, but I'll even say, uh, no matter what I've started, I tend to finish it at some point. I might do so begrudgingly, but <laughs> but I will finish it. There, I can't think of a single title where if I started it, I didn't at least at some point make it to the end. Now there had been, I mean, because I've watched a lot of really old films. Sure, you know, I'll I'll pick up something from the twenties and thirties sometimes. If the copy is just so bad. It's not that the the content of the film; it's just how it's presented. Right. The sound, like I, you know, there's just too much of a hum. There's too much static. It's so dark you can't see what's going right. on. I, I will give up and just go. I, I, I've been down that road, wait, waiting for the better version that hopefully you can take in. 
so that you can actually take in the content. I, I totally get that. That That's just, that's the parameters of trying to take anything in. If it looks like you're staring through a peephole to watch the damn thing, then, yeah. then that's not how you watch a film or a TV show. It's just not. Right. Yeah, so the actual film quality will play in it. If it's just so bad or... There was a film I was trying to watch from from the 70s, but it was obviously not ever really truly released on like VHS, DVD. This is someone's like 16 millimeter print that they digitized or something like that. Yeah. And the sound was pretty bad, but then the picture itself was one of these things where you're watching and the entire time there's like that white line going down the screen, you know, <laughs> yeah. or something yeah, this and it won't go away, you know, and then there's the hair that comes up and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, once again, uh, you can't take in the content because the media is so distracting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it doesn't become about the story or the acting or the effects. It's just the quality is garbage, so you can't observe. It, exactly. So those those are the types of films that I will tap out on. Sure, and I get that. that that's that's not really uh, that's not really in the parameters of what I'm. Uh, I was trying to get at with the questions. So, um, but yeah, Great. no, I love that. That's kind of it just ingrained in us. Uh, if we've if we've started it, we're we're gonna go on this journey with you, whether we like it or not. <laughs> it might be through gritted teeth. It might be, <laughs> but then then we learn what not to what what path not to go down the next time. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, my wife has asked me that same question because she'll know I'm because I'll sit there and start making fun. I'll <laughs> you know I, she can tell I'm not enjoying it. She she's it sees it and goes, "This is." crap why are you still watching it and it's like because i started it <laughs> there there is a little thing of uh yeah uh, uh, of like uh, media ocd you gotta take it to the end <laughs> yep that's been my week my weekend was really busy i'm not gonna bore everybody with this just know i was up really really late and i was very busy over the weekend but um i didn't get a chance to watch a whole lot but that's that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Yep. Now, on uh, my end of things, uh, I've been a little all over the map, uh, definitely finishing up. I finished up The Mandalorian, which I'm not going to get into. Um, uh, there's uh, the time with Picard. And then I, I was looking for something new to take in, and I stumbled across on Amazon Prime, and especially since I saw it only had when I started it about like eight days left on Prime before they were going to take it down. So I'm like, all right, I'll try the first episode of this thing. It looks like an interesting concept. And then I just got absorbed and I zipped through the entire 10 episodes of the first season in three days. Um, this uh, is a series called From. It's uh, apparently from the MGM Plus uh, streaming service and just happened to be on Prime at the time. Uh, it's going into its second season right now. It just released its uh, first episode of the second season with another one on the way. Um, this is a very uh, Stephen King feeling kind of story. It starts with the, this family of four in their camper van. They're driving down the road. They almost run into a tree that's fallen across the the road, they decide to turn around to go find the next place to turn off. Um, and in turning around, they find they pass through a town that they don't remember seeing. And then they keep driving. Um, and they there's only the single road. And it doesn't matter how long you drive on it. You come right back to that town. So you're already, you're now in a pocket dimension or something you are in a place that you cannot get out of um and interestingly enough while we're on the uh, we start the the series with the plight of this family um we're starting to get introduced almost immediately to the other characters of the town who they've been stuck there for a period of time all of them for different amounts of time everybody comes to the town from a different place in, in the country um, at a different time. 
Um, oh, okay, interesting. Like, there are no residents of this town. All the residents of this town are the people who got stuck in this town under the exact same scenario. They all come across this tree, across this road. They weren't all on the same road. They weren't all in the same state. Uh, they they literally come across this tree. They get stuck in this town, and they're there for the duration. Um, and each of them, as they come through, they add a layer of complexity to this town for good or for bad. Um, and that's how this story starts to evolve uh, immediately after our family arrives and they're exp immediately explain the situation. But in explaining the situation, they're told that as night falls, that they have to remain indoors and that there's this little black rock that has to hang in the door. Uh, otherwise, these creatures that look like people with big grins on their faces if they can get into the house or if they can get a hold of you they're going to eat you <laughs> so so therein lies of course the drama you you've got people from all over the place they have no association with one another they're just thrust into this situation into a situation where they can be up and out during the daylight hours, but at night they have to be in total lockdown. And any mistakes will render uh, everybody in the home completely dead. <laughs> um, and on top of it, these creatures, they try to tempt you. Um, if they think they can access the thing or talk you into letting them in and they have to be let in, if this talisman is uh, at the doorway, then you start getting into seeing how the psychology of a creature like that works with some of the people that are in this situation. Um, it was an amazing 10 episodes. They flew by. Um, uh, one of the stars of this is uh, a for, uh, um, actor from Lost who played uh, the character Michael from that. Uh, the actor's name, Harold... Perry knew um, he plays the sheriff of this town and is kind of the after we meet the family he's kind of the thrust of the, the storyline he's trying to help figure out how to keep everyone safe and get them all out of there at some point um, and then the complexities carry on this season of course ended on quite the we, we resolved nothing and everyone's kind of in a in a really bad state so and because the nature of this thing this series has some real good potential legs um the uh first season actually ends with a what looks like a tour bus of some kind pulling in into town so uh as quickly as you can kill off of people from from this town ah you can bring in more like that so you have the angst that can occur from just constantly introducing new and uh, diverse characters. It's some, it, it should be a lot of fun, but it really made me feel like um, both reading and watching some of the, uh, uh, what, what was uh, Stephen King's thing, Under the Dome. It had, it had, it hit on stuff like that. It had elements from, oh God, Salem's Lot and all that. Yeah, no, it, if it, it's not written by him, but God, whoever the writers are in this, of which there are many. Um, John Griffin is uh, the uh, is the creator of the show, but he must have read every Stephen King book ever. Because it just feels like that. Elements of the stand. It's just... It's a good series. Uh, I just hope I can figure out how to watch more of it. Season two, uh, yeah, when it comes around, hopefully you can find it. I either dig or save up my seven-day trial period of MGM Plus and just yeah, just <laughs> binge the second season when it can, when I can. Yeah, wait till they see if they put the second season out all at once, or if you're going to have to wait a year while they do it. You know, one episode a week, sort of thing. Yeah, I, I mean, knowing that there's now an MGM Plus too, when there's a Paramount Plus, there's Prime, there's Netflix, there's 
HBO Max, which is about to become just Max, um, you got to wonder when, where's the end of this? Uh, like, Yeah, is there is there a saturation point? There, there's got to be, and it, you already see some of it playing. Like, uh, there's a Showtime one as well, but Showtime is trying to pair with Paramount+. Plus. So they're trying to find their little connections to one another so that they can not create such a chasm. But the problem is, is every time they merge a little bit, they also up the price. Okay, wasn't that sort of the, the deal with HBO Max is that they're kind of merging with their, what, Discovery or something like that? Yeah, because uh, Warner Brothers kind of owns the whole kit and caboodle. But yeah, they're trying to merge... HBO, Discovery, and all TLC, all those things, and because they had started a Discovery Plus channel, and that thing was garbage. Yeah, <laughs> the only thing that was good for was watching old MythBuster episodes. Right. <laughs> well, that'd be really great if that comes to the max, <laughs> wouldn't it? But at, yeah, at, at what cost? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. So you just kind of wonder well, when does cable return? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we uh, we we see at the end of the tunnel. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, but no. If anyone's out there has any thoughts on from, please uh, share them. Uh, I and if you're looking for something kind of dark and brooding to watch with uh, hints of mystery all over it, this is this is a good one. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I might try to. Uh figure out a way to catch that myself mm-hmm. it sounds interesting yeah no i think i like the idea of all the different different people from different times getting pulled in and yeah no, being stuck there i mean it's not like they're pulling from different completely different times it's just they don't all arrive all at once they don't live there nobody lives there oh i see, I see. although okay. they are alluding to the possibility of an of an origin character one guy there is one guy he's been there longer than everyone and he's the space case that uh, he behaves like a child. Um, he and he kind of creeps everybody out. <laughs> so there's more to be told about him, I'm sure. So yeah, yeah, no, totally worth a watch. Cool. Well, if you don't have anything else, uh, go ahead and take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And then when we get back, we're going to talk about the fantasy adventure film from 2006, Aragon. Welcome to Film Gazers, a podcast focusing on the science fiction, horror, fantasy, trinity, and 20th century entertainment. I'm Steph. I'm Jess. We're cousins slash besties. Join us as we reminisce, discuss, and review films from our childhood. Follow on Instagram at Film Gazers and listen to the show wherever you like to get your podcasts. Later, taters! time of dragons dragon riders will come again you're the next rider bring the boy to me you're the only one who can save us Alive. They will follow you. One false move, and everything is lost. I'm the rider, and I say we go. We fight as
Aragon is a 2006 fantasy adventure film directed by Stefan Fangmeier. Or do you, do you think he says Stefan? Sure. Oh, I was thinking Stephen, but Stefan. Based on a novel of the same name by Christopher Paolini. Young farm boy Aragon, played by Edward Spellers, who we just talked about to some length on Picard. I actually didn't realize as we were watching Picard that we were going to be seeing a film <laughs> that starred the young man. This is his, his first major motion picture. Yep. Uh, Aragon discovers a mysterious blue stone while hunting in the forest. The stone turns out to be a dragon egg, which soon hatches. As Aragon bonds with his dragon, Saphira, with the help of a storyteller named Brom, played by Jeremy Irons, he discovers that he is the last of a group of warriors called the Dragon Riders, who were killed off by the evil king, Gabatorix, who appears here, played by John Malkovich. When the king's forces destroy his village hunting for him, Aragon sets out to find the last forces of resistance to defeat Gabatorix and restore peace to the land. The way to find the mythical Varden people is paid with dangers and Gabotorix's minions, including the evil Durza, played by Robert Carlyle, who will stop at nothing to destroy Aragon. And yes, as I said, this is the feature film debut of Ed Spielers. And now I've seen two things with him. I'm not sure I've seen anything else with him. I've seen him in this and Picard. Yeah, no, I don't know him from anything else myself either. This is also the directorial debut of Stefan Fangmeier. He's mostly known for doing visual effects work on films like Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, and he also worked as the second unit director on Galaxy Quest. He has, to date, not directed another film. I should uh, also mention that uh, while this film did do okay at the box office, it more than doubled its budget. So it was considered for a sequel, which was the original plan. Uh, due to backlash from fans and critics, the studio decided they weren't going to go ahead with that. <laughs> Just going to bury the lead. I'm not going to bury the lead and go, good call. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid, afraid so. This, I read a lot of reviews not so much reviews, just comments about the film. And people were saying how that this was effectively Star Wars. And they were complaining. And apparently the author has been haunted by, by that his entire career. The original books, people were saying, were derivative of like things like Star Wars and, and Lord of the Rings. And I'm thinking, okay, fine, you know, you can levy that criticism if you want, but then you also have to let it levy that criticism against... George Lucas and to probably some extent Tolkien as well. Right. Until I watched this film, I don't know if this is just entirely the the original author's fault or if a little bit of the uh, the studio and the director's editing and meddling. But this was almost a blatant ripoff of Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of. Um, I mean, the hero's journey is nothing new. That's been happening for... that's That's been the story for thousands of years. You could, you could take that back to, like, like, Gilgamesh and things like that. The Bible. But, the Bible. <laughs> but this, this film, I swear, I think you could probably sync it up to the soundtrack, to the audio track of Star Wars, and... All the beats are almost identical. Uh, there are times I, I, I wish they had, because <laughs> uh, I'm going to dip into a, a little bit of the technical, uh, like the soundtrack in this thing was as generic as anything could be. I mean, nothing rose to a level of drama or anything. So there was no presence in the music. There was no presence in the film at all. No, uh, all of the... Uh... Here's the thing. I I'm going to give a little credit to to Ed Spillers here. His heart was in this. He, he was trying. I mean, this is clearly his first film, and, and it, he is trying his best in this. The dialogue is garbage, uh, but... But he was the only one that I felt was like actually into the character to which he was playing. 
and everyone else was reading cue cards. Mm. Everyone. Yeah, I might. <laughs> yeah, I I might agree with that. Um, Jeremy Irons, when we just saw him recently in Dungeons and Dragons, right? Uh, he of course played a little bit more of a the villainous role in Dungeons and Dragons, if I remember correctly. Uh, despite the fact that that didn't go so well, he wanted to uh, do this film because he thought this one had a better chance. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Irons. <laughs> uh, I, well, I just wonder if Jeremy Irons ha- has a basic love affair with medieval-style movies. He appears in an awful lot of them. I don't know if you call it wooden or just generic. It's just no one other than perhaps... Uh, Ed here is Aragon. No one really tried to like step up and stand out. Um, and maybe it's just because I've seen Robert Carlyle as this sort of villain. Right. It, he even he just seemed. Uh, I've seen this act before. I, I'm guessing uh, when he was in. Uh, well, what was this show? It was on television for a while. Wherever it was, all the. Uh, the fairy tale characters uh, living in the real world. Oh yeah, it was once upon a time. Once upon a time, thank you. Yes, and he was he was Rumpelstiltskin. Yes, yeah. A, a villain very much like uh, Durza here, I, and I, I wonder if Durza is what got him the part. In once someone and <laughs> when they're looking for casting for Once Upon a Time. <laughs> they saw him in, in, in Aragon and went, hell, he's perfect for Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> that could be. Um, well, and you had brought up John Malkovich. I can't think of worse casting for, for the what they were going for. John is a great actor. He had no business being in this film um, and no business being the kind of bad guy they wanted him to be. I, he's supposed to be like the king of the dragon riders, the one that uh, took the rest of them out so that he could take over the land for himself. And he doesn't have that kind of gravitas. No, he he was he was supposed to be the emperor. <laughs> like you could picture John Malkovich in the Durza character more than in the Glabertorics, whatever you you call him. Uh, I, I I was. I'm going to take that moment right here to just go the language, like the, the language, the terminology, the stuff that they try to, I get that this all came from a young adult series book. Um, but the names, the places, the things that they would say, I understand even the author was a teenager when he wrote the thing. Oh really? I, I, I understand. That's that's what. In which case, it feels like a teenager wrote this. Yeah. It. The, uh, yeah. The names definitely sound like a a young kid. That's what they would make up. Right. Yeah. No. It, 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 it's like you watched all the sword and sorcery stuff ever, and you took all their names. I'll put. You took all of that language, put it in a blender, and let it spit out whatever. That's mm-hmm. that's how you got the names for all of this stuff. Yeah, if you want to talk about Aragon being creative at all, Aragon as in era gone. Yeah. Because he's, you know, the dragon writer and, and and it's almost dragon just with a different starts with a different letter. Right. So it's like right. yeah, it's a little too spot on. <laughs> yeah. Like there's no Yeah, there's it, it's yeah. It, it, it would have been more believable if his name had been Jerry. <laughs> 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 I'm trying not to be too harsh, but I mean, it, it's a freshman or sophomore level entry into anything. It's not polished. It, it, it is like I, I don't even know if how the books read. Uh, from what I gathered, um, this movie was not a really good representation of the book either. Um, no, no. So, no. I, I, the the books are were apparently really popular. Yes. No, I, I remember them being very popular. But yeah, no, and is often the case. You know, when a book is turned to film, it doesn't do as well. <laughs> you know, the, it, it, it it's rarely a good a a, a good um, adaptation. 
Yes. And, and this film in general, uh, regardless of the source material, there there was no motivation for anything and nothing that you ever bought. Like, our hero loses... We watch him wrestle with a cousin, uh, have conversation with an uncle once, um, winds up in the middle uh, get, get, getting this egg uh, completely out of nowhere, and then manages to have his cousin go off to war. Uh, his, uh, his uncle gets killed. Um, we're supposed to care about all of this, but it happened so fast. We're talking... What I just described to you was probably the first five minutes of the film. <laughs> yeah, it felt that way. Yeah, what what I read, it was like a, a 500-page book condensed down to a you know 90-minute film. Right. To which... So, yeah, there is a lot lost in the translation. Right, and, and when you have these kind of names and such and you just thrust us into there's no explanation of anything you don't know you get a little bit of voiceover at the beginning um but i mean we don't get any ground rules for all of this this also suffers from the same reason i tend not to like magic things in general it's a cop-out it's too easy to write the as soon as you painted yourself in the corner, you just say hocus pocus backward, and now you're out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I abhor that. That's just lazy writing. So clearly, this book series did develop more of an overall mythos, but we didn't get any of that in here. We got got to smack at you with a, a couple of facts right away, and then set you on your merry way, and give you no reason to care about anything that's happening. Yeah, I, I hope the books explain a little bit more or don't have Aragon being completely ignorant of the land in which he lives. Right. How the hell does he not know that there once was dragons or these dragon riders? And it couldn't have been that long ago that these things happened. Brom was a dragon rider, this battle. So it's not like it's been so long that history's forgotten them or something. We're only talking maybe... 20 years if 30 years just prior to aragon's birth yeah if that he may have been theoretically this stuff could have happened and been alive for all right. we knew there's other people in the village that knew about it right as soon as uh like when he tried to sell the egg because he thought it was a stone um once the guy got caught wind of what it was probably uh he wanted no part in it so i mean this is recent. <laughs> this is not. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's just it. Throughout this whole movie, there's no motivation for any of the things that happen in it. It's it's a phrase I've, I'm kind of getting tired of using. I need to come up with something better. It's, it's motivation because the plot said so. Right. No, I mean, it, you can't get away from it. That's, that's part of it. But, I mean... But we rush our way through all of this. Like, literally, um, the, the, the entirety of this film takes place in, what, three, four days, maybe? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little hard to gauge time, but, yeah, I, I'd say certainly less than tops. a week. Yeah. And, and that includes the birth of a dragon to its essentially its adolescent stage. And it, that happened in the course of a day. <laughs> yeah, again, that's something I read was truncated from the book. The, in the book, it takes at least a, like a month of him and the dragon uh, bonding and, her, and the dragon growing sure. before reaching her, her final size. Right. And, and this is where I dare say not that I want more of this, at least not in the state that it's in. This is actually something that would probably lend itself better to a series well, it's funny you should say that. Isn't there one coming? <laughs> 15 years after the film's premiere, fans of the book series tweeted Aragon Remake in an effort to get Disney, the rights holder now, after acquiring 21st Century Fox, to revamp the book series into a possible television show for Disney+. Plus. Mm. The hashtag began to trend, uh, and Paulini found out about it and, even in, and then encouraged the fans to keep at it. 
And on July 25th, 2022, Variety reported that a live-action television series adaptation of Aragon was in early development for Disney+. Plus with Paulini possibly serving as a co-writer on the series. But as of April 23rd, as of April 2023, there's no confirmed Aragon TV series release date. But it is possibly still in production stages. That's what I kept coming back to as I was watching this, is I'm like, if you would actually slow this down, take the time to do it and actually do, I don't know, some character development... Because that was the other thing, is like, we're supposed to just incidentally care about all of these characters. We've had no time with them. By the time we get to the part where Brom dies, and the dragon's broken up about it, Aragon's broken up about it, I'm like, you knew him for a half hour. Which is another where I feel like I'm watching Star Wars. Right. Because it's the same thing when Ben dies. Luke's known him all of a day. Right. <laughs> And it's like he lost his best friend. Oh, I can't believe he's gone. And then, of course, he's consult. I, I don't want. Never mind. I'm not going to go into the star. My Star Wars rant. But, <laughs> but yes, that's where it just it feels so much like Star Wars in this. Yeah. Because of things. Because of things like that. No, I, I, absolutely. And, and those things were any less forgivable because it's Star Wars. Um, we accept yeah. them because. We loved Star Wars. <laughs> now, it's possible that Aragon was closer to, to, to Brom. I mean, maybe he had a relationship with him. He knew him. They were in the same village. Sure. B- but we obviously don't see that. You know, it occurred to me, this really does feel like, this feels like one of those TV movies that are made from a series <laughs> where they just take a few episodes right. and chop them, chop them up and then throw it together to make it into a film. Yeah, the stuff on the floor is the stuff what we needed to care. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How'd they get to this place? Doesn't matter. Yeah, that we had to edit that out. Yeah. And then ultimately, there was not a single like action sequence, fight, whatever where I actually cared about the outcome. It makes the cardinal sin of any action film in that it's boring. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just boring. There's nothing, there, there's no meat on this bone. It, 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 it's picked over, it was picked over before it ever hit the theater. Uh, I, they, they took a, a popular book series, they scaled it way too far down. That book series was probably already far too derivative. So this became even worse. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, despite decent effects, and all that for the time. It I just didn't care. None of the things that happened on the screen felt like anybody that was involved cared. It, it didn't give me a reason to care. I felt like half the people were literally staring at cue cards off screen uh, to, to read their lines. It had way too much um, incoherent dialogue. Uh, with the weird names of things and all that, without any explanation of what these were, <laughs> like, it just yeah the whole the, the the magic and yeah if you if you know the name of things you can control that thing and that, all the magic just came out of absolute nowhere oh, yeah. and and then it and then it became integral to the plot but there was moments where it's like well when did he learn to do that just just knowing the name that's it you don't have to be special. I, do you have to be a dragon rider and you need to use this magic? Can anybody do it? Can I just go around and keep saying whatever the hell the word was that makes me think of Sheldon on Big Bang Theory? <laughs> uh, it wasn't Bazinga, but it was really close to it. And and, and start fires. <laughs> now I'm not going to be able to think of anything else now <laughs> related to that. You've made it more entertaining now, at least for me. I don't know. I, I got the same vibe when we watched Dungeons and Dragons. The the costuming, uh, especially when we get to the end and he's in his pretty costume to ride to ride uh, the dragon into battle. I like. 
I, I don't know. It, it, it just looks like we're trying to make a poster more than we are actually supposed to go into a battle. Uh, I mean, they're playing on the fact that Ed's a pretty, uh, is a pretty, pretty young man. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, it's the type of armor that is, that you see in a young adult yeah. adventure series. It's meant I mean, to it, show off the fact that he's a slender, fit guy. It well, serves it's no just, purpose. It, <laughs> It it doesn't look like anything that a um, a civilization at this technology level, te- technological level, would be able to produce. Right. But there it is. Um, you asked last episode why was this even on our list, and I do think it does fit on this list because I thought the effects and the the the, uh, the dragon. Uh, the visual effects, I thought, actually did look really good. I, I will grant you that. Uh, given for 2006, this is probably some of the state of the art CGI at the time. Uh, at no point did I not. There, there were a couple where I could see that. Okay, he and that dragon are not in this scene. Um, they, <laughs> they do some um, interesting stuff, like when he's trying to climb on the dragon. And her wing is just tucked just in the right spot to hide the uh, scaffolding that he's climbing on to get to the height. <laughs> um, and, and I catch those moments. But overall, it looks it looks good. Yeah. No, it looked good. I mean, they actually kind of took a few steps that they didn't need to. I mean, the uh, dragon had the, you know, was dragon scales, but her wings were like feathers, Mm -hmm. feathered wings, instead of like a a bat wing or something that you might expect in a dragon. And you got to think, the bat wing would have been easier to render. Sure. But they went with the feathers, so that, you know, kudos to them for taking the initiative and taking the extra effort. And I think that came across really well. Now, does Rachel Weiss' voice really sound like a dragon's voice? Uh, I, I won't, not for me. I, I, I won't deny a moment when I can listen to Rachel Weiss, but <laughs> 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 but but yeah, no, I, I don't know. It, and it's funny, and now that you're bringing up her voice and all that, the communication method and the the again this just has to go with the speed of the film uh, the fact that they're like bonding like they've been together forever in what is literally the course of a day or so it's just, it's just off putting you're like mm-hmm. you didn't even know a dragon existed 5 minutes ago and now it's your best friend forever well, it's because they were fated and to be together because she chose him. Sure, yeah, but I mean, it hit all <laughs> those tropes too. Uh, he he's the chosen one. Your dra- the dragon chooses who it hatches for, and then only talks to you. It talks to you in the head. Oh, it gives you magical powers. I'm like, dear lord, this thing's the Swiss Army knife of creatures. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. Oh, and it can die, and you won't. But if you die, it does. Like, God, what? What aren't you going to throw at this thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is not a great film, no. uh, and it's it. Yeah, it's just not good. I mean, there's not really much else to say about it. It's just a really bland attempt at an adventure story, and it definitely derivative. You just you can't escape that definition, right? With no, this, it just there there was potential there, and I it just saw all of it wasted. I'd be very interested to see if something actually comes of this of a like a television series mm-hmm. where they can actually pull more out from the book. I, there might be something there. There, there could be. There absolutely could be. And now that uh, it's been as long as it has, it, if the writer's on board with this, this is an opportunity to kind of mature it a bit and maybe, maybe take what was already a popular series and take it to another level um, if you do it right. Yeah, but don't take it too far or else people will accuse you of being derivative of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Which, what was it? I, I think there's like a, I, I remember this like from an English class or something. There are truly like only three stories in mm-hmm. the world. 
everything is derivative of that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. So, well, it, it it is possible that we just we've had enough of the magical dragon adventure <laughs> stories, and it might be you know you need to let some distance you know between. Uh, yeah, no. In fact, if anything, Disney, if you're out there and if you're de- developing this, uh, with 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 Prime having already done what I guess came out more as a lackluster attempt to carry on Lord of the Rings, uh, I, I, their series was popular enough and did well enough that it'll continue. But uh, like, it was more of what no one was asking for. Right. So. Yeah, these things tend to run cycles, and, and it, it's actually where we're awash in too much media, um, so everybody can make them all all at once, and it, trends never go away long enough for you to go, you know, I'd like something back in that genre again. We don't get that break anymore, so now it's too much. Yeah, maybe we, we really need one before we get another sword and sorcery adventure series or film well i did put this to social media to see if anyone else had actually watched this back in the day or since yes we did get some responses over on facebook uh fiona says that i remember going to see it but don't remember much about the movie good or bad Eh, it's that kind of film Mm. i've been meaning to rewatch it though especially after seeing the leads appearance in the recent season of Picard, which is what made me realize that it was the same person. I had no idea. Billy Flynn says, it's not that it was bad. It just wasn't good. It was boring. I kept waiting for something to happen and it never did. (laughs) Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Kind of, yeah. Over on the Discord server, uh, Steph says, didn't like the books, didn't like the movie. My husband still enjoys the books, though. He's a fantasy guy, and I'm, a, and I'm more sci-fi anyway, so I can see why he appreciated the novels. On Twitter, Ewan Blake says, Typical fantasy film separated from the book, it's a decent watch. Irons and Carlisle, for me, are the standouts, and Safira's CGI during that time would have been impressive. Compare it with the books, and you know how that turns out. And he follows, though my dad watched it with me a while ago, and even he didn't like it, having no knowledge of the book, so maybe it's worse than generic fantasy for some. (laughs) (laughs) I'll still stay and buy the the CGI, I think, still looks pretty good, so... Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's one of the saving graces. Yeah. What did the critics have to say? That's all the social media. Ah, over to the professionals. Um... Uh, as I discovered the, uh, and you and I reviewed, uh, there's a good chance Roger Ebert missed this. So one of my favorites to go to uh, probably didn't get an opportunity to review this at the time. But uh, over at the Boston Globe, we have Wesley Morris um, of the day. And I'll read this little snippet from him. In hacking Paulini's book to the bone, the movie's three screenwriters use a glut of exposition to drag us to the climactic battle sequence where sloppy editing prevails. Darn if I could follow it or tell what was at stake or who was who. I did catch, uh, and I always, I'm going to be careful, Jaman... Hansu. Hansu, yeah. thank you. I keep uh, having struggling with the name. Standing around a cave... <laughs> Looking chic in costumes, presumably from Ralph Lauren's feudalistic uh, collection. (laughs) The mess that's been made of all of this money is maddening. This isn't economically or economical movie making. It's a deluxe trailer for Aragon (laughs) Two. Like, like, wow. And then over at the New York Times, Jeanette uh, Katsolis. I'll read her last little bit here. The film's few moments of hilarity are no less welcome for being completely unintended. The young hero's heavy breathing romp with a strapping male cousin could only have been envisioned by someone completely lacking in subtext radar. Though Into the Sky to Win or Die doesn't have quite the same mythic flair as One Ring to Rule Them All. 
And if some of the characters won't be returning for the sequel, no matter, in likelihood, neither will the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it just goes on from there. Uh, there's a, a little snippet from Film Threat, uh, Pete Von Der Haar. Uh, and th that's a weird uh, spelling on that one. Um, Aragon is laughably bad, mind-bogglingly derivative, and easily one of the worst movies of the year. The best of the reviews that I could find was something out of San Francisco Chronicle where uh, Peter Hartlob actually wrote, Aragon might not be a big Oscar contender, but in a movie season filled with blood diamonds, fascist soldiers, and Idi Amin, it provides a much needed afternoon of PG rated family friendly adventure. The fact that it just wasn't a heavy film is the only thing it had going for it with that critic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe really young kids would find a lot more enjoyable in this than, than, than we would and or did. Right, and I, like I said, I'm not familiar with the novels, um, but this is a young adult series. you got to figure um, heartfelt relationships are supposed to be involved in this. There's obviously supposed to be the bond between the boy and his dragon, but there's some allusion to some possible romance with uh, one or other character uh, and and our heartthrob hero. Um but we don't ever get into any of that. We don't know anything about that so, because we didn't get any character development. So I don't know why we're supposed to even care to show up at the second one if there had been right. one. Certainly one of the more disappointing uh, entries in our series this year. A bit, yeah. But maybe not as disappointing for some as the next film, assuming we go this way. <laughs> What's, the one on the schedule... Is 2007's Transformers. Uh, I say we take it. Uh, actually, if anything, the first one is the watchable one. <laughs> <laughs> More than meets the eye. Well, that was the hope. For all Huge hit. Maybe the biggest hit on our list. But it's also the biggest disappointment for many, including one of our hosts. That was my description of this one. Yes, sir. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. That's that. Yeah. I am a, as Chris knows, I am a huge Transformers fan. have been since it debuted in 1984. And to see someone so harshly destroy what was actually a decent storyline was just so terrible. So, but we shall watch it. All right, we will check it out. It's been a been a hot minute since I've seen this first one. I'm sure I saw it probably when it first came to DVD or something. That's probably the only time I've watched this one. It's good timing on our part too, seeing as how uh, literally in June we get another Transformers film. Oh, I wasn't even aware. Rise of the Beasts. <laughs> Oh, that one, right. I was aware. Yes, you were. You just didn't know just, it was sneaking up on you so fast. Nope. All right, well, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back in a couple weeks. Uh, Tom, thanks very much, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll power through this one together. Yes, we will. You, you, you'll be there for me, I know. You'll, uh, I appreciate your company on this. You, you'll come on here. You're in a safe space. You'll be good. <laughs> Absolutely. So anyway, any thoughts on the Transformers, send them our way. Follow the link in the show notes or send an email to timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. See ya.